Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 577 of the podcast. And it is Thursday, the 30th of September, 2021, as I record this. And of course, it's going out in the first week of October. And we have three months left of the year. So I hope you're thinking about what you want to achieve in the next quarter. I'm certainly thinking about that. Anyway, in today's show, I'm talking to Jonah Lehrer about how we can use the principles of mystery to hook our readers and keep them reading, regardless of the genre we write, as it also applies to nonfiction as well as various genres of fiction. We also talk about how a mistake Jonah made a decade ago essentially ruined his writing career, but how he eventually came back to writing and how he's changed the way he researches and writes to avoid such a thing again. And I really valued Jonah sharing such personal stuff. It really is important for us as writers to learn from our mistakes. Plus, we talk about why podcast interviews can be better than mainstream media for book marketing. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, so Amazon KDP Print is now offering hardcovers as well as paperback through the KDP dashboard. So you should all see that now if you're self-publishing directly through kdp.amazon.com. And the only annoying thing that I have discovered is that they don't do the size I usually use, which is annoying (laughs) because if I want to use them, I'm going to have to do a new format. So I will probably just change my sizing going forward, although chances are they're going to offer some more formats uh, over time. Now, I have been doing hardbacks on Ingram Spark for years and I love them. I do them as part of every launch now. I always have uh, ebook, paperback, large print, hardback, audiobook, five different formats aiming to have all of those on launch. Although sometimes the audiobook's a bit bit later. But yeah, it's uh, really good to have the option of print on demand hardbacks. Now, remember, if you want to be available on libraries, bookstores, festivals and online sites like bookshop.org, you also need to do Ingram Sparks. So have Amazon and Ingram Spark together, which is what I do for my books and haven't been able to do that for hardback before. But now I will also do it with hardback. So I will be doing my first one in the next few weeks. I just need to have a look at doing that, sort out the files. <laughs> it wasn't, it's not just a case of uploading the same files, unfortunately. But uh, yes, as I say, I'll probably work through the backlist as well. And of course, it's not necessary to do hardbacks. It's not necessary to do any of these formats. But if you do this as a business that you want to provide formats, uh, all the different formats that readers like, hardback is definitely one of those. And certainly something I've found since uh, since moving a lot into audio, weirdly, is that I like to have the audio book and I like to have a hardback if it's a book that I want to uh, continue going back to or in fact in multiple formats <laughs> there are some books I have in ebook and hardback and audio book that I just because you know, I read in different ways at different times and yeah That's just to say, I know I'm not the normal reader, but those of us who are writers are often what they call whale readers, which is we spend a lot of money on books. We love books. We're book people. And therefore, having these different formats is super useful. And then moving from futurist into the mainstream news section. Yes, I am now going to be covering NFTs and blockchain within the mainstream publishing news because uh, Book Vaults has launched the first book specific NFT platform. And uh, their tagline is creating digital first editions for independent authors. Their press release says this is all about authors taking back control. For many authors, advances and royalties have been declining dramatically and subscription models and marketplaces such as KU have seriously undervalued the work of the writer. Book Vaults gives the writers a chance to earn up to 90% of every sale by using NFT technology to protect their digital assets. Book Vaults also opens a secondary market for the resale of NFT books, something which has never been possible before with other ebook formats. 
NFT books will strengthen strengthen the bond between authors and readers. We want to see authors and publishers benefiting from NFT technology in the same way that it's helped musicians and artists in their respective industries. And we want readers to be able to cherish new and exciting digital content for the first time. Book Vaults empowers authors to expand into multimedia storytelling. When publishing an NFT book, authors can now add on videos, maps, audio snippets, memes, author interviews and insights, family trees and much more. So I am intending to do an NFT release by the end of the year, as I've said, but I am waiting a bit longer as I know of at least two more book specific NFT solutions that should launch in the next month. So generally October, Frankfurt Book Fair, lots of things get launched at Frankfurt. And I know of some that are launching. Plus, of course, there are the mainstream platforms used for visual and other art uh, music musicians as well. So OpenSea. So Yeah, if you don't know what I'm talking about in general, NFTs, check out episode 555, 555 for a discussion. And I will be doing another episode on NFTs, maybe even two before the end of the year. One where I'm going to talk to some writers who are actually using NFTs already. And then probably one once I do one myself to explain what the hell's going on. <laughs> but yes, I like a couple. So I, I will link to their um, their press release or they've put an article on Medium in the show notes. Uh, but you can also go to bookvaults.com. But as I said, I am going to wait a bit longer. I want to see how this shakes out. This to me, it's what's interesting is how they describe this. So they're saying NFT books, so they're calling an NFT book, which is interesting, because of course, these are ebooks, generally, these are digital assets. But NFT books, I don't know whether it will be an N book or there'll be something that we'll start using as the terminology. But remember, this is limited digital editions, which I really like. And this there will be much more of this to come, my friends. And it's kind of good that we're talking about it alongside hardbacks, because I see this just as another format. And I have some things that will go into my NFTs. And it'll be very interesting to see how this develops over time. In useful stuff. Do you want to learn more about the writing craft and the business of being an author and pay what you like for an awesome ebook bundle? Yes, you do. <laughs> the NaNoWriMo Story Bundle is out now with 16 books on planning to write and productivity, how to be a writing machine, discovery writing and plotting, character development, plus tips on publishing from release strategies for indies to avoiding the slush pile if you want to go the traditional route, as well as several books on marketing. It is available for a limited time at storybundle.com forward slash nano, N-A-N-O, storybundle.com forward slash nano. Get a great Great bundle of books and help more authors sell direct. And me and Mark Leslie Lefave, or Mark Leslie Lefave and I, have a book in there. Uh, the relaxed author is in there. So if you haven't got the ebook yet, you can check it out in the bundle and tons of other amazing books. Well, 15 other books. <laughs> so go check that out, storybundle.com forward slash nano. And also on improving your craft this this month, check out the free self-publishing conference run by the Alliance of Independent Authors at selfpublishingadviceconference.com. It's live on the 23rd and 24th of October 2021 with 24 sessions over 24 hours. And you can also access the replays. There are sessions on dialogue, motivation to write, plotting, as well as writing back cover descriptions, emails, legal agreements, and much more. Sign up for free at selfpublishingadviceconference.com. So yes, two very useful things for the craft and business of writing this month. And of course, as ever, links in the show notes. In my personal update, Tomb of Relics is with my editor, which is a serious relief. It is 31,000 words, so it is a novella, and I am really happy with it now. Every word has been hard won, to be honest, so I'm pleased I can move into the finishing energy phase with this one. I'll talk a bit, a bit a bit about my editing process in a minute. But as this episode goes out, I will be walking the St Cuthbert's Way in Northumberland in the north of England from Melrose to Lindisfarne, Holy Island. Well, it's kind of the border, border region between England and Scotland. It's very contested. <laughs> the last day involves walking across the sands to Holy Island and you have to time that right. So uh, you can follow my progress on Instagram or Facebook 
J.F. Penn author. And after the discussion with Jeremy Bassetti a few weeks back in episode 573, I have decided now that I'm writing three travel memoirs that will be smaller. The first will be The Pilgrim's Way, the second on this walk, Cuthbert's Way, and the third one will be The Camino de Santiago, which I'm doing in 2022. Uh, I'm still thinking about how I will do this in terms of my branding. Some days I think it will just go under JF Pen. Other days I think I need a new travel brand, Joe Francis Pen. And if you listen to Books and Travel, you'll know I introduced myself on that podcast as Joe Francis Pen. So yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, obviously this is all me, but It's more about the algorithms and auto ads and all of that type of thing. Do I want to go that route? But do I want another author brand? So yeah, there are pros and cons both ways. I don't have to decide right now, but I will have to decide in, I guess, the next few months. But I do have to write something first. I do actually uh, already have sort of 15,000 words for The Pilgrim's Way because I've already done a lot of work on that. So yeah. I'm excited about doing those books, but as ever, it adds to my massive list of the books I have on my queue. (laughs) But I'm a bit more relaxed about that now, as I talk about in The Relaxed Author, because I'm not a plotter in a detailed sense, but I am someone who plans on the big picture, but I don't plan this is the book I will write next until I feel like this has to happen. And so I have all these different books and I kind of shuffle them around and then this one has to happen next. So I'm still thinking about these things and you you will no doubt hear about it in the next few months. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Vesta Giles said, loved this with Mark Leslie Lefebvre. I have panic attacks thinking about co-writing, so this was really helpful. And uh, like Mark, I write in Word too, and I love my spreadsheets more than I can describe. (laughs) I tried Scrivener and wanted to throw it out the window. (laughs) Great to see how you can use two completely different platforms and make it work. Yes, I was surprised too, but we did manage. And Marion Hill left a comment, another excellent podcast. I will share that I continue also to use Microsoft Word for my manuscripts. I write all my first drafts in longhand and then use Word for my following drafts. So Mark, you're not the only one. (laughs) Clearly, the interview with Mark gave everyone happy times with Microsoft Word. I, when I left my day job uh, all those years ago, now a decade ago, in fact, before then, I bought a Mac to start using outside of my day job because for me the kind of windows and microsoft was all work related so for me mac is the creative other side and i know they got me with the branding but it just shows you how uh, creative branding can make a difference to people's mindset and finally beth ball says i'm a week late in my listening but the episode on audio drama and podcast fiction with sarah werner has my mind swimming with exciting ideas and possibilities for storytelling and adaptation for novels streaming and podcasting epic fantasy i'm really pleased beth i also feel the same way i i literally feel like there is not enough time to create all the things we want to create i mean seriously that's just it's just an explosion in possibilities these days right so today's show is sponsored by pro writing aid which is very appropriate for this episode as it is a tool that will help you improve your writing and your editing but also has a plagiarism checker so i've spent a lot of time with pro writing aid this week in the final run through of tomb of relics so how does it work Well, you can use it as an online version or on your computer, and I use it integrated with Scrivener, but you can also use Word or whatever else you use to write. It's got tons of integrations. You import or open your document, and then ProWritingAid runs a series of checks over it and underlines things based on what needs fixing. And there are lots of different things and no doubt we all have slightly different issues when it comes to our writing. For me, the first thing I do is the passive voice check, which is fine sometimes, but our writing is stronger when it's active. And I know I overuse was or had and what this really helps me do is rephrase things to make them more active. So that is super useful. Obviously, I don't always make the changes like you don't always make the changes from a human editor, but I really love that passive voice checker. Also, comma and other punctuation usage, which is still something I find difficult and we all do. You will never have 100% correct punctuation in a document, I tell you. Uh, Even things like missing um, spaces or overuse of spaces, 
obviously things like overuse of words as well I think that's really good for example I in this manuscript it said you have started three sentences in a row with the same word (laughs) and that was just really good to point out because we want variation in our books more important for audio especially it will also say try a stronger word it was kind of underline something and say try a stronger word Uh, or things tips to enhance readability sentence length, cliches, even use of inclusive language. So I, my prologue for Tomb of Relics is set in 1183 <laughs> in medieval times after the murder of Archbishop Thomas Beckett. And essentially, uh, the the knight whose point of view it's in uses a word that now Pro Writing Aid considers not to be inclusive. <laughs> but there is absolutely no way a knight in 1183 would ever use a word that was inclusive. So in that case, I left it. But it's very useful. Lo- just so many things. I really heavily, not rely on it, but I I wouldn't want to do my books without Pro Writing Aid anymore, to be honest. So my process is to finish the draft, then I open Pro Writing Aid, run the whole book through it, and you can do it in chapters. Uh, I do it with Scrivener. Again, you can do it how you like. Then I print it out, hand edit the whole thing. Uh, again, update in Scrivener, run it through Pro Writing Aid, and repeat the process. I actually did that four times <laughs> for this book. I still use a professional human as well, a human editor, but I don't want to pay someone else to fix what I can fix on my own. I prefer them to focus on other things, uh, things that I might have missed or uh, more sense sense checking. So Pro Writing Aid is an important part of my process and I also put it through the plagiarism checker just in case, which you'll hear about more in this interview. You can check it out for free or get 25% off the premium edition at prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna, where you will also see my tutorial, prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna, J-O-A-N-N-A. That was quite a long ad read, but to be honest, I am pretty into Pro Writing Aid at the moment because I've just been in it all week. <laughs> So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to new patron this week, Michelle Campbell-Scott, and also to all of you who've been supporting the show for months or years. You are amazing. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars or euros or pounds or whatever a month, a couple of coffees a month if you're feeling generous, and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio. You get to ask your questions and I answer, and it's a special, it's about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on how many questions I do, and uh, I answer pretty much everything. You can also get money off my ebooks and audiobooks and courses, and you can support the show at patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com forward slash The Creative Pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Jonah Lehrer is a New York Times bestselling author of nonfiction and a journalist. His latest book is Mystery A Seduction, A Strategy, A Solution. Welcome, Jonah. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you. So let's get right into it. Why a book about mystery? What was it that drew you to write about this topic? I mean, the book is full of examples drawn from the canon, from great works of literature, from Hamlet to Emily Dickinson. But what actually inspired me to write this book was watching my son watch YouTube videos. He fell down the rabbit hole, this specific genre of kids YouTube video called Surprise Eggs. Which to make a long story short, if you haven't had the pleasure of watching these inane videos, it's essentially parents make these giant paper mache eggs and stuff them full of toys. And what a child does is he punches a hole in the paper mache egg and then pulls out the toys one by one. But it's like a slot machine for toddlers. They never know what toy is going to come next. So it's incredibly exciting. And I watched him watch these videos and just become enthralled by them. And then I quickly realized he wasn't the only one that a lot of these surprise egg videos on YouTube and the surprise egg genre is now one of the most popular genres in the YouTube kids world that, that he was just enthralled by this narrative trick of not knowing what toy was going to come next. And you can look at these videos and their stats on YouTube and they have billion plus views. Uh, Ryan's toy review in particular, he's one of the most subscribed YouTubers in the world He's credited with pioneering the surprise egg and his 33rd YouTube video of all time. And so I just became fascinated by this idea of why kids were so entranced by mystery, by these mystery boxes. And that is really what 
what led me down this long winding path, this investigation into mystery, not just on YouTube kids, but in Shakespeare, but in poetry, in advertising and magic tricks and so forth. Mm. Well, and for all the people who want to write nonfiction, who are listening or do write nonfiction, I'm one of them. Uh, how do we know when an idea is big enough for a book? Because you're pretty academic from what I've read and uh, you go deep into it. Mystery, I mean, in one way, it's really massive and in another way, it's really small. So how did you yeah. know that this idea was big enough for a book? It's such a good question, and I wish I had a better answer. But for me, I, I just kind of follow the thread. So it began with me thinking about why my child was so entranced by these YouTube videos that I found so inane and kind of consumer consumerism at its most banal, just like a kid tearing open toys and not even playing with them. And and then what happens is I start to see connections everywhere, and and I just start putting them together. I create these massive word files. And then I give it some time to breathe and I see what hangs together. And slowly over the course of, I think for this book, probably two years, a structure gradually emerged. But at the beginning, what I'm really looking for is a subject that's capacious enough, that's wide ranging enough, that I guess is vague enough where I can just start to collect stories that fit. And then I fall in love with the stories. Mm. So I'm diving down a publishing rabbit hole already. We'll get back to the book in a minute. But when do you pitch the book to a publisher? Uh, because you're traditionally published. Is that something that you do once you've got that structure? Because again, just the word mystery to me, I think fiction, but you've turned it into this nonfiction book. So when did you pitch that to a publisher? When did you know it was right? I'm fortunate enough to have a really wonderful relationship with my editor at Simon & Schuster, Ben Lonen, who's just one of the best. And we have a casual relationship where I was able to go to him fairly early in the ideation process and just say, I'm really interested in these kids' YouTube videos. And I think they've got something to do with characters in Hamlet. And I think he probably gave me a pretty funny look, but <laughs> he he was encouraging and said, keep pulling at the thread, see what happens. And then I'd say... Six months later, I sent him a messy proposal. It was kind of sprawling. And I think what I wanted to do with that proposal was to give him a sense of the breadth of the idea that this wasn't just a book about detective stories. I certainly talk about Agatha Christie and Edgar Allan Poe and Law and Order and all the rest. But it was a book about mystery broadly defined, about why we're drawn to the unknown across all these different domains. And, and really, I wanted to be an investigation of this fundamental hook of culture, how great artists throughout history have always used the unknown to intrigue and seduce the audience. And he had some truly wonderful thoughts. I think a great editor, they bring that outside perspective. They read it as the reader and not as the writer. And, you know, they see all your flaws. They see all the structural issues. And throughout the process, I think what he really helped me with this book in particular on was the structure, was trying to take this very amorphous topic and try to give it an arc so it would build to something. That advice was there. Thinking back on it, it was there from the start. So you, the subtitle is A Seduction, A Strategy, A Solution. And I was thinking about it from the, the point of view of the people listening and writers in general. To me, it's a strategy, really, for our books. So how can we bring elements of mystery into our books, I guess, regardless of genre? I mean, I think there's something to be learned from looking at how the great ones have done it. So one can deconstruct an Agatha Christie story or an Edgar Allan Poe story and try to figure out what is it about this detective genre that, that I think Poe largely invented that makes it so perdurable, that makes it last. So it's not just a popular genre of literature, but it's also one of the most popular genres of television, the procedural. And it's the same basic idea, right? It's this omniscient detective, this deductive cop who can solve the impossible crime. They connect the dots and no one else can connect. And what is it that's so appealing about that? The basic assumption of this book is that we can learn from successful art, that the art that works and the art that lasts can teach us something, not just about the art, but also how the mind works and what the audience wants and how we can create art that really fits those strange grooves of the human mind. Um, as a strategy more generally, I, I think it's important to remember that what the audience is most intrigued by is the unknown. When we say something is suspenseful, that the pace is quickening, what we're really saying is that we don't know what's going to happen next. And I think too often we put too much information in. We're too concerned about 
people getting lost, people being a little confused, people being surprised by twists that come out of nowhere, when the reality is that's the fun part. That's the part that we love the most. At a high level, I think the strategy is just to remember that people are really fascinated by the unknown, whether it's toys in a paper mache egg or not knowing who committed the crime. I guess I'm I'm looking for some more practical ideas for how people can do that. So, for example, Lee Child, obviously great thriller writer, talks about open questions. And I mean, I like to use cliffhangers at the end of a chapter, sort of uh, open the door, but we don't know what's behind the door. So I think what you said there about not giving too much information up front is really important is one of the main things. But what are some other practical ways we can bring mystery into our books? Well, I think there are a couple discrete ways. One is the mystery box. So the mystery box is a specific technique where you create, you know, I talk about in the book in terms of George Lucas and Star Wars. And the idea that when you watch the first Star Wars, the movie really does lurch from one mystery box to the next. So you don't know who the Jedi are. You don't know what the Force is. You don't know who Obi-Wan Kenobi is. And I think if you're reading that from an editor's perspective, you might say, George, this is just too confusing. Uh, You need to give us more background here. We're completely lost for the first hour of the movie. And I think what Lucas realizes is that's what keeps us engaged. We're in this immersive world. We have no idea what's going on. And that's why we pay attention. It's the same with the first chapter of Harry Potter, which I dissect in the book, which all these strange things are happening. Talking cats, this on this very ordinary street, this bizarre world is unfolding and we don't understand any of it. And we see the world through the eyes of Harry Potter. And and that's what's so interesting, the fact that we don't understand it. So I think especially when you're introducing a new world, I think it's important to let the reader be confused, uh, to let the reader not know what's going to happen next. So I think at the level of plot, it's important to not give too much away. As Agatha Christie put it, it's the chase that people want. Uh, The whodunit is most interesting before we know who did it. But also at the level of character, I think this is a more neglected virtue of mystery, which is that sometimes we we want to ensure our characters have clear motivations, our clear, our characters are transparent and easy to understand that they make sense in some larger sense. And I think when you look at literature and the best characters, the characters we're most interested in, they're the ones that befuddle us. They're the Hamlets of the world, the Tony Sopranos of the world, the characters who we don't know what they're going to do. And that's why we really have to engage with them and simulate their minds and really try to figure them out. And that's what's most interesting to us. So I'd say it's also not just plot, but also character. Yeah, I mean, you're right. When a character is uh, like in the Star Wars example, they know what the force is. So they don't need to explain it to each other. The worst um, extra dialogue is, uh, so you remember, Jonah, when we went to that thing last week? (laughs) Of, you know, backstory thrown in dialogue because we don't no, know it, how else to do it. <laughs> and that can be so tempting because you feel like you're giving the reader a hand, you're doing those data dumps. And I think that doesn't just slow down the pace of the story. It actually detracts from what we find most interesting, that that at some deep level, we don't want to understand. I, I was lucky enough to spend time with the writing staff of Law and & Order, and they really see their job as confusing and surprising the audience for 41 minutes. It's the 42nd minute where you give away the answer and the crime has to be satisfying and the gears have to click into place. But they really see their job as for most of the show, for the first 41 minutes of the show, you don't want to know who did it. You don't want to solve the crime because then it's not interesting. And it's interesting, though, because I I feel like mystery readers, crime readers uh, and watchers, obviously now TV and film, are some of the most intelligent readers. And they it takes a lot (laughs) to actually hide things from these readers. (laughs) And it's annoying to many of us who read the genres, you know, publishers now put in a fiction uh, subtitle, the most explosive twist you will not expect. And of course, that's (laughs) we all go, well, of course, we're going to figure that out. So where's where's the line I guess between making it so so difficult to figure out that we surprise people but also avoiding that sort of deus ex machina oh suddenly it was this person who we've never seen before and that betrays the the rules of story 
you know, I think that's where the art comes in. There's no simple formula that can tell you exactly how to calibrate it. It's just on the one hand, of course, you don't want to completely befuddle parts of the Star Wars to return to the Star Wars analogy. Parts of that world have to make sense. We can't be completely lost. We need a guide. We need a character who can kind of lead us through, whether it's Harry Potter or Luke Skywalker. So we need to feel like there's someone there we can trust. And I think that's part of the virtue of the detective formula uh, is, is we feel better, even though we ourselves are confused and we're there to be confused. We're there to not know the answer. I think what mitigates that confusion, that sense of anxiety is this detective is, you know, is the Sherlock Holmes who's going to lead us through and we're confident in the end, he will figure it out and show us how it worked. I think there are also the principles and, and, This is something Poe and Conan Doyle really perfected, this notion that the crime should be deductive in some way, that at the end, we should be able to look back and understand how it happened. So it shouldn't feel random. And I think that's an important principle of the genre that is often violated. And I find personally, when I read a detective story, and and there is that Deo Machina coming in, swooping in at the end, it's, you just get so angry. (laughs) You know, it's, oh (laughs) gosh, I just wasted a lot of time here. So there are those basic principles of the genre that I think the best ones do obey. And yet at the end of the day, it's a formula that shouldn't feel formulaic. So I think when you look at my favorite detective story writers, my favorite crime writers, they often use other aspects of the genre, other aspects of the novel to bring in layers of richness, whether it's deep, complicated characters who who, who aren't just Xeroxes of Sherlock or really interesting crimes or kind of they introduce you to an entire underworld that you never thought about before. So it's not just the same old crime story. They find other elements to also make it richer. And then I think this is really interesting too, between discovery writers, I'm a discovery writer, and um, plotters and, and planners. I mean, obviously with nonfiction, you're, you're a, a plotter and a planner uh, structure. But those of us who are discovery writers, I find I only really know the ending once I get to the ending. And then it's a case of, actually going back and adding in a few lines, not to make it obvious, but to foreshadow the inevitable. And that is the that is the trick, isn't it? Making it seem like an inevitable uh, who did it or, or ending. But you can put in that later. I feel like many people who are just starting out writing don't realise that you don't have to write in order. <laughs> you can no. go in and add things in. You can add in a red herring later. Or you can add in some foreshadowing later and in order to make it not too obvious, but also inevitable in some way. No, absolutely. There's a, one of my favorite stories in the book was told me by Otto Penzler, who runs the mystery bookshop in New York City. And he, Elmore Leonard was one of his dear friends. And he tells the story about Elmore Leonard coming to him in the middle of the night and saying, Otto, Otto, I got this terrible problem. And I'm paraphrasing here. So my main character died on page 122. And Otto says, well, well just unkill him, you know, just like change it. He says, I, I can't. He's you know, in a sense, he was the quintessential discovery writer that here he had this character he loved, but he was writing this bar scene and his main character got shot and died and he couldn't undo it. The twist felt right to him. So then he had to solve the, the rest of the book with a dead main character. And to me, that was such a great example of why Leonard's work rises above the genre, uh, in part because he's constantly violating the rules of the genre. He's following these characters who are these rich, complicated human beings on the page. And if they die on page 122, they die on page 122. Uh, Then he's got to discover the rest of the book. But to me, it was like this great example of why it doesn't have to be this meticulously plotted and outlined work. You can also just trust these characters that they're interesting and they'll tell an interesting story too. Yes, yeah, so although J.K. Rowling obviously has the famous spreadsheet that <laughs> you can find online if you Google J.K. Yeah. Rowling spreadsheet and it, it, you clear plot lines and all of this. So it can definitely work um, both ways. But I wanted to ask you, you have this really good section around reviews that reveal plot twists. And many authors get very upset about this. And But we all know <laughs> engaging with reviewers is, on Amazon over reviews is often not, not a good idea. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um why is the spoiler not such a big deal after all? I mean, to be honest, this is one of the social science findings I found most surprising in the books. So this was a real plot twist for me. Um, you know, we live in this age full of spoiler anxiety. Spoiler alerts are everywhere. And yet when you look at the scientific literature, and this is mostly the work of Nicholas Christenfeld at UCSD, 
he's, he'll give people a variety of works of literature from different genres. So detective stories, literary short stories, and so forth. Everyone from Sherlock Holmes to uh, James Joyce. And then he'll give them different kinds of spoilers. So some he'll just include a sentence at the front saying how it's going to end. Some he'll write the story. So at the beginning of the story, he'll rewrite it. The beginning of the story actually gives away the end and so forth. And what he finds is that for good works of literature, for good stories, stories that people like to begin with, spoilers actually make them more enjoyable. That we actually enjoy the story even more. We give it higher ratings when it's spoiled at the start. Now, there's no easy explanation for this finding. I think there are a couple of different things going on. The one I find most persuasive is that when a book is good, there are many layers to it. There are many mysteries built in. The mystery of Harry Potter isn't just who's going to win, Harry or Voldemort. In many respects, we kind of know Harry's going to win. You know, most genre fiction, it's got a predictable ending. The good guys are going to triumph. There'll be a wedding at the end and so forth. So the big part of what we enjoy in the book is everything else. The building of the characters, the writing itself, the layers to the world, the way the story unfolds. And it turns out when you give away the ending, when you know how it's going to end, that frees up more mental bandwidth. It gives you the space and the ability to really enjoy all those other layers. So, I mean, that's one of Kristenfeld's leading explanations is that it kind of gives you more space to enjoy our favorite parts of the book, which it turns out is not just the mystery box at the end. So I think we should be less anxious about spoilers. I also see spoilers as, you know, a really good test of a story's worth. So no one complains that Hamlet is ruined when you know Hamlet dies. No one complains that if you know Harry Potter wins at the end, you're not going to want to read Harry Potter. These are works that endure even when you know the end. And that's why we keep rereading them. That's why we'll keep watching Hamlet over and over again. That's why my... 10-year-old daughter has read through Harry Potter. I think she's on trip number five because these books are unspoilable. And so I think that's, it becomes this really interesting test of the worth of a story is if you spoil it, do you still want to read it? And I think in many cases, the answer is yes, and we'll enjoy it even more. I think that's so useful. I've read the book, obviously. I think this is one of the most useful insights from my audience because I feel like everyone, especially in the mystery genre, the crime genre, this obsession with the twist, the surprise, the ending, who murdered is who, but you're exactly right. I want to enjoy my whole experience of the book. And in fact, if you overhype that bit of it, then the rest of it might fall short. So I I love this. I think it's it's so important. I wanted to emphasize it to everyone listening. Obviously, we still want to have good endings and good twists and good stories. But the whole thing, uh, as you mentioned, your daughter, my husband, who's uh, in his late 40s, but he's watched The Lord of the Rings. I don't even know. I mean, and he reads it, he listens to it in every single format, hundreds of times over his life. And the story never stops being so brilliant to him so and, I th- yeah sorry no, you keep discovering new things I mean I mean that mm. I think the greatest mysteries are really infinite games they're stories you can go back to again and again and again and they keep giving you new questions not not the same answers but new questions and I think that's the real test and that's what makes them so unspoilable now you know that said I don't want to diminish the fun that can be had in puzzle fiction, in in detective stories that maybe I don't want to read again, but man, they were fun on the airplane that first time, or they were fun on the beach, or they were fun just they kept me awake till 2 a.m. because I needed to know how it ended. There's tremendous joy to be had in those works too. And I think those can be spoiled. So, so I don't think it's true of all fiction that it's unspoilable, but it's true of a particular kind of fiction, which is the fiction we want to go back to again and again. And I think that's what most writers aspire to. So not a book that shouldn't be spoiled, a book that can't be spoiled. Yes, perhaps you all aspire to write that, but for those of us who earn a living <laughs> with, <Yeah. laughs> with writing books, sometimes the rules of genre and a story are important. And we, yes. we write a book that people race through as uh, James Patterson, obviously the highest earning author in the world. It's all about page turners. <laughs> So, yeah, I think, yeah, there's a room for both. Just one question also on nonfiction. Obviously, uh, you're you're a nonfiction writer primarily, but can the rules of mystery be used in nonfiction to get people to keep reading? Absolutely. I think it's the same basic principle. 
which is you don't want to give away the answer at the beginning. You want people to feel like you're still unfolding new information, that there are new twists in a sense. In this book, I structured the book loosely from the simplest way to create mystery, which is with mystery boxes, to talk about the magic trick approach, which is art that essentially hides the mechanics of its making. So you see a magician perform a trick and it's not who did it, but how did he do it? And that's a trick of creativity that's been used by magicians, of course, but also painters throughout history. How did they paint that that way? And and they hide their tricks. So that becomes the mystery. Uh, There's the mystery of disfluency, making the work a little bit more difficult. So it forces the audience to engage. And that brings us in deeper into the world and wakes us up. It makes the art more fulfilling to solve. Uh, There's the mystery of character we talked about. And I think there are all these different strategies one can use to create mystery. And my goal with the structure of the book was to keep introducing these new facets, these new twists, so to speak. And at the end, to put them all together. It's certainly not plotted tightly like a great James Patterson book or an Agatha Christie book. But I think even in nonfiction, you want to keep asking yourself, why would a reader read this chapter? What is new here? What am I teaching myself? What do I expect to learn from this? And that's that's why for me as a writer of this genre of book, I think it's really helpful to see the book as an investigation where, you know, you asked me in the beginning, how I choose a subject. And I think for me, it has to be a subject I really feel like I don't understand. And the hope that that part of the joy of that investigation will rub off in the writing. And you'll feel my curiosity as I explore the subject, the fact that I'm writing this to discover myself. I'm writing this because I don't know, and I want to figure this out. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I write nonfiction as well. It's generally, I don't really know what I think about this, or I I need to learn about this. So I might as well write a book about it. (laughs) No, no. And you hope the fun, the fun of that discovery, that childish joy of not knowing, you hope that rubs off. You hope that's that's somehow maintained in the writing. I think especially as we go back and work on version 112, it's easy to scrub that out. It's easy to, to kind of feign omniscience at the start. And so I'm very conscious as a writer, as I go back and edit and edit and edit, to not lose it all, to maintain some of the joy that was there as I made these connections in the moment. Now, I wanted to turn to your career as an author, and you actually just said the phrase, losing it all. (laughs) And in your pitch email, you mentioned this very public failure nearly a decade ago now. So what happened and how did you come back? How did writing help you recover? Um, I mean, it was a devastating failure. I I made some really terrible mistakes. Uh, In a book proposal I was writing on creativity, I was rushing to finish. I I was taking on way too many projects. And I included some fabricated Bob Dylan quotes, some Bob Dylan quotes that, you know, captured the gist of what he was trying to say about the creative process, but were not his quotes, were completely mangled. In essence, I broke the most basic rule of my profession, which is to quote accurately. And those mistakes were discovered. The book was pulled from the shelves. I lost my job as a staff writer at a magazine and all the rest. It was very public. It was very humiliating. And and for a long time, I really didn't think I'd ever write again. You know, I, I didn't think I should. I thought I'd failed too badly. I didn't trust myself. And then as the years went by, I realized how much I missed writing, that for me, writing was really a way of making sense of the world, as we've discussed. It wasn't just a job. It was a way I kind of walk through life and and ask questions about it. And when I lost that ability, I I just missed it terribly. So I started writing for myself. And then slowly, those drafts, and this was a book that came out uh, five years ago, about love and attachment theory. That book really became an investigation into, you know, I lost my job. I lost everything I thought I wanted in life uh, professionally. And yet I was still standing. I was still, something was holding me together. And it was my family. It was these loving relationships. And, And so that became an investigation of attachment theory and the science of how these relationships give us support and get us through the toughest times. So that was that investigation. But but that book really began as kind of 2 a.m. journal entries, these late night musings when I couldn't sleep. And to be honest, I've never enjoyed writing more. I've never had more fun on a book than I did on this book. So I think there is there's something clarifying looking back on it 
um, about my professional failure. It, I think, definitely made me a better writer, definitely helped me figure out why I wanted to write. It wasn't just for the praise or the sales figures or whatever. It was because I need to, because this is part of who I am. And I think in the fall, that was a very, very clarifying revelation that, that I write because I need to. And so that that is really why I write today. I'm really glad you've come back to it. Uh, I do remember uh, when you emailed me, I was like, oh, I remember that name and uh, sort of remembered that happening. And I'm so glad you've been able to forgive yourself and get over it. You know, I because <laughs> what's so crazy now is we're even in this even more difficult time, I think, with a sort of cancel culture and social media and things that make it difficult for writers and look in the grand scheme of things what you what happened what you did was not exactly a massive deal I mean you said it was the most important thing in your your job was quote accurately but I mean seriously there's so many important things more important in life right but uh, I mean I mean mean, I see from the perspective of journalism and nonfiction writing there are rules there are sacred rules and it's a self-enforcing profession and that's why I think they come down very hard on people like me who broke the most basic rules. And I, in terms of the cancel culture aspect and the public shame aspect, I, I, I do get asked about that a fair bit. And the question, you know, I never quite know how to respond because looking back on it now, the most painful parts are all private. It's not what Twitter said about me. And, and this is just, I should be very clear. This is just my experience. Other people are going to have very different experiences, but For me, looking back on it, it was my own private shame of, I made these mistakes. How could I let this happen? How could I do this? And it wasn't, it wasn't the noise happening on social media. So for me, before I trusted myself to write again, it was really, how can I ensure this will never happen again? How can I construct a process as a discovery writer like you, someone who writes to figure out what they want to say, which is very inefficient and, and and comes with its own downside. But how can I, knowing that's my process, how can I construct the process, you know, how can I construct a method that ensures I'll never fail again? Cause I couldn't go through that again. Oh, absolutely. And, but I think let's say inadvertent plagiarism, even if people don't intend to use someone else's quote or make up a quote or something. Sometimes these things happen in a sort of, as you say, if if you don't have a process. So if people want to stop anything like that happening, what are the rules and practices that you have that others might be able to adopt to to stop it happening? I mean, this is just my process. I want to be very clear about that. (laughs) I, I should be the last person giving out advice on kind of writing methods. But my own process now is I, of course, tape record every interview. I have the interviews independently transcribed. And then when I'm done writing about the subject, I don't just send them the interview. I send them the entire section of the book. And this is very unconventional. And I totally appreciate that. It wouldn't work for, a, say, a Bob Woodward or an investigative reporter. But you know, when I cover a scientist, say, or when I cover an artist, when I write about Nicholas Christenfeld's work on spoilers or his work on what makes sports interesting, or if I spend time with the writers of Law and Order, I want them to feel like the book accurately reflects their experience as well. So I just send them the actual material that covers them in the book. And if they want the larger context, I'll send them the larger context. And I'd say 95% of the time, it comes back with no notes or very minimal notes, small requested changes. Occasionally, people will say, you know, I know I said the quote this way, but here's what I actually meant. And with very few exceptions, I see to their changes. Again, I realize this is completely unconventional, but this is my method now. And then at the end of that process, after I go through and send the book out to everyone in the book or everyone whose research I write about in the book, I then hire an independent fact checker to go through it again. So that's my process. It is time consuming. To be honest, I couldn't imagine writing without it. Looking back on myself 10 years ago, I am frankly astonished at how careless I was in terms of not hiring a fact checker, not sending out the material to my subjects in any way, shape or form. So this is just my 
again, to repeat, and I'm sorry, I have a broken record here. This is just my method. I'm, I'm not sure I'd recommend it to anyone else, but this is a method that has evolved over time. So I feel comfortable at the end of the day, putting a book out there, ensuring that I've done everything possible to make sure it's as accurate as possible and reflects the views, ideas, and experiences of those in the book. Well, of course, this is a podcast. It is about your opinion and your experience. But I would add, I mean, I, I do a lot of nonfiction, but I don't generally do interviews. But with books, when I write notes, I will always put quote marks around things that someone else said. And that's like anything that is not my words has quotes around it so that I always attribute. And for people listening, you can also use plagiarism and checkers online and things like that. Because I worry about accidentally using a quote as my own words that that's what I worry about because you know sometimes you're using things and for some reason they came in somehow so I worry about inadvertently doing it but there are as you say there are practices that we can all put in place we're careful um, and then we check things and I I think all of this is is good practice whatever genre you write yeah no I I, you know the brain is a connection machine and it often loses track of where its ideas come from, and it remembers in fragments and snippets. So in many respects, plagiarism is is an understandable sin, but it happens and it's still a sin. And that's why I also use, I run my own plagiarism check and the fact checker runs their plagiarism check. Just, it's like a double safe process. It's just one more step, but again, it's to help me feel okay putting a book back out into the world, dealing with my own anxieties about it. And it is time consuming. It is expensive, but I couldn't imagine doing it any other way at this point. Yeah. And and I think that's great. <laughs> You've obviously matured as a writer and um, as a professional. So that's fantastic. But I did want to ask, I mean, your first book uh, tradi- in traditional publishing was 2006. And of course, we're now living in quite a different time. And I mean, you had that love, the love book, but this is probably your biggest book for a while. So how has publishing changed since you started? And what are you doing differently in terms of book marketing, which everyone listening always wants to know about? Oh, it's a great question. I mean, 2006 feels like a lifetime ago, uh, just in terms of the available channels. I mean, podcasts didn't exist. The world has only gotten, I think, harder for books to compete in. At a high level, what struck me in 2021, uh, kind of publishing a book in the hopefully, knock on wood, the waning days of a pandemic, is just how many alternatives people had. So I would look at the price of my book, it's $20 on Amazon or whatever, and think, oh my goodness, that's two months of Netflix, or that's an infinite months of Instagram. And I would just do the accounting in my head. And I think books are, it's a hard ask, especially of a younger audience. Books require engagement and work there aren't flickering screens that have been optimized through A-B testing to grab your attention and keep you engaged. And I think that that was part of the background for why I wanted to write a book about mystery, you know, for for artists and writers was just because I think we've never needed to engage. We never needed to work harder to engage the audience. We've never needed to be more aware of the tricks that work and the strategies that seduce uh, because our audience has so many options, so many other devices and screens and platforms competing for their attention. And as a writer, you can't run those A-B tests. You're just writing what you can. You're just writing what makes sense to you. Um, So to, Sorry, that was a long winding digression, but I think it's never been harder to market a book, I think is my general impression of 2021. It's never been more difficult to grab the attention, the very scarce attention of an audience. So in 2006, it was, we did a lot of drive time radio and a lot of, you know, the big aspiration was in the States, national public radio talk shows. So a lot of local NPR shows. What what's made this book so fun has been able to do, has been being able to do all these podcasts. So podcasts I've loved being able to be a guest on them, being a longtime fan and then being on the show is super fun. But it also gives you a diversity of questions that I've never had before with the book. People will read it and approach it from so many different directions and find different parts of the book or different parts of my story interesting. And that keeps it fresh. 
my memories of publishing books in 2006 and 2010 were everyone would ask the same questions based on reading the book jacket. And so you do drive time radio and it'd be six hours of saying the same thing over and over again. And obviously that's a privilege to be able to talk about your book, but there was something mechanical about it. And, and I really love the informality and differentiation and uniqueness that comes with being on a podcast. So that's the big change for me is just kind of thinking at a higher level about it, um, kind of at a more practical level. I'm not sure I've gotten, I'm not sure I got very good advice. I'm To be honest, I, I don't think I'm particularly good at marketing my books. I just try to write a book that, that I think other people will hopefully find interesting and then just try to be honest about the way I came to the book and what I find meaningful about it and why I wrote it. And hopefully people respond to it. Hmm. Well, then I, I totally agree with you on podcasting, obviously. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it's interesting to me that you pitched me personally, unless it was someone, uh, you know, no, no, not, no. it was you personally. And I get so many pitches every day from PR people but I mean, obviously I'd heard your name before, so that helped. But equally, I think the author pitching directly and you obviously included some things that I would find interesting. That to me is the secret of a successful pitch. Like I would much rather hear from the author with something that I might be interested in than a PR person with just the general, you know, here's the top points. So in that way, you are doing good marketing because you're pitching oh. personally. So was that like a deliberate thing? because obviously traditional publishers often will give you a PR person to do that for you. You know, I had a great PR person who pitched the national media and we've done some national media, but for me, the parts I enjoy are, as I said, being on podcasts, I enjoy. So being a longtime listener and then you get to have a conversation too. That just, the, the little boy in me just finds that thrilling. So I personally pitched just, you know, a short list of my favorite podcasts in different genres I pitch sport, my favorite sports podcast, my favorite writing podcast, my favorite literature podcast. And, you know, it was a very short list. But for me also, given my story, my personal story, I wanted to make sure people understood that I, I wanted to talk about everything, that, you know, the conversation didn't need to be limited in any way, shape or form. And I think, again, that's a really good marketing hook because people want to know the the, the author behind the book, don't they? It's not just yeah. um, here's what's in my book. It's also the, the deeper stuff about you and you as a creative. So I actually think you've got quite a few marketing tips there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's part of the pleasure of podcasts for me, too, is that they can be more expansive. They can meander. They're less formal. They have more time. And so you want to make sure you can tell the story as fully as possible. Mm, absolutely. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? The book should mystery is in bookstores everywhere. It's on all the online sellers. And I have a blog I should update on jonahlayer.com. So and maybe if I send people there, I, I will be guilted into writing a new blog post. <laughs> well, thanks so much for your time, Jonah. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. So I hope you found the interview with Jonah interesting and I have another interview on more detailed research and citation techniques coming up soon. So we will revisit this important topic. And of course, in the meantime, check out prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna if you want to use their plagiarism checker or the rest of their writing and editing tools. So next week, I'm talking about building better worlds, anthropology for writers with Michael Kilman. So back into world building and oh, always fascinating topic. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.